Hey, Heather, what is that right there in the water? So that is Formidium, which is a type of cyanobacteria. I know we pulled it out in the sample when we were here before. Uh, we've got a lot of different things going on in the water. You've got the green, and then there's like a film at the top, and that is planktonic species of cyanobacteria. Uh, there is some green algae in there too, but the predominant species here are the, the planktothrix and the microcystis. But then this stuff, and you see it over here, little chunks floating up different places. That's a type of benthic cyanobacteria, which means it's bottom dwelling. It grows at the bottom and just like filamentous algae, it then rises to the surface. It's really common for people to think that that's string algae, um, but this is so much darker than string algae. If you look, it's, it's almost black. Um, so if you see stuff like that in a pond, it's, it's probably not algae, it's cyanobacteria. And, that can actually be just as toxic as the stuff that makes this water green. Good to know. Join us as we take a fishery that was on the brink of producing a world record coppernose bluegill and rewrite how fisheries management is done in the 21st century. This is Slab Lab 2.0. Oh. Hey, I'm Sarah Parvin and this is the Slab Lab. This is a five acre pond known for growing some of the largest copper nose bluegill in the world. So then tell me, walk me through what the game plan is for today. Like as soon as we get started, what does that look like? Yeah, so we're going to start by taking some dissolved oxygen readings with our meter. We're going to set up that buoy today to do the data monitoring so we can get a good 36 hours worth of, of data um, okay. to, to track here to start. We'll, we'll treat the whole pond with, with muck, uh, muck biotics. Yeah. Okay. Muck pellets, unlike the bacteria that you pour in yeah. the liquid and it disperses everywhere, the pellets aren't going to move a whole lot. So they're going to have an area of influence and that's where they're okay. going to stay. So getting it distributed throughout the water is important. Throw them right at Ann so you hit her. Just none, <laughs> none of the lens. I think it's quite remarkable. You know, this pond has been pushed really hard for the last be 30 years this coming May. A lot of, we grew a, a, a bass pond, grew really big fish out of that. And after we had a fish kill, we decided to turn our attention to the copper nose, actually Sarah did. I wasn't so much in favor of it. That was what she wanted to do. So that's what we did. And the rest has been history. Now, with what Natural Waterscapes has brought to the table and their kind service, and their partnership with us has made all the difference in the world. We're watching right now, as I speak, the effects of the metaflaw. Yeah. And it's, it's quite impressive. Remarkable. The factor is the more dissolved oxygen you have, the better the product reacts. Back in June, I think, I had made a post about a surface aerator. And we had a um, follower of ours tag Sarah and say that, I'm ready to go. yeah, thanks. Um, she should get something like this for the slab lab. And then somebody else chimed in too. And so I clicked on who it was and I was like, well, maybe I need to reach out to Sarah Parvin. So we connected and we talked about all of the issues here at the slab lab, you know, growing trophy fish, the cyanobacteria that they have, the overabundance of nutrients in the water, just the growing concern for what could happen in the future because um, this pond was at its breaking point in essence. So we looked at some options together. We So the, the surface aerators that we're putting in, we actually had quoted that back before the fish kill for her um, and, and put a plan together on what what would work there. And then we also started talking about Metaflock at that point. And that wasn't something that was initially on her radar, but it just made sense given the issues that she has and knowing how good of a product that is and all the things that it could do to benefit a trophy fishery like this. So we went down that path, but 
you know, nothing really became of it right then and there because, um, you know, it, it is a huge financial commitment to do a complete reset of a body of water. You know, you're not you're not talking about, you know, one or two thousand dollars in maintenance treatments like so many people would have in a normal size pond with normal conditions. This is this is extreme. This is an extreme fishery. So we kind of tabled it for the moment, just something to think about for the future. Um, and you know, Sarah, obviously Sarah loves fishing. Um, I shared a few pictures with her. She also loves bulldogs. So we just kind of kept, kept in contact over the next month. And then I got a text from her the day of the fish kill, just a picture of, um, fins sticking out of the water. And I actually had to zoom in because I wasn't, I didn't realize what I was looking at. And it was just um, all of the fish belly up on their side with their fins out. It was really heartbreaking. And um, we decided, I talked to her, and I just, like, at that moment, I was like, I got to get down here. Um, we already know what needs to be done. We need to collect as much data as possible, and we have the capacity to do that. Um, if you don't have the data, then it's hard to make a plan. Uh, so two days later... We were on a plane and we came down here, collected a lot of different samples. Um, and just from there, the, the one sample took a long time. That was the sediment phosphorus fractionation that took about three weeks to process that. But we used all that data then to put a plan together. And, you know, we just made a commitment together. We were going to partner up on this and we were going to turn this thing around and reset it the right way so that a uh, massive fish kill like happened um, back in July doesn't happen again. And I mean, there's just not a lot of information out there. Yeah. You know, you, you, you only get so much from the books, like you're actually seeing it being done live. Like yeah. Applied management is uh, kind of lacking. Fisheries management, there's always been this preconceived conception that having green water, 18 to 24 inches, that's going to be able to grow big fish, big bass, stimulate the, the food web so you have zooplankton that's going to go all the way up and drive for big bass. Supplement that with some you know, pellet feeding and you can get some pretty decently sized bass. And what happens is when you start getting you know, to that 18 inch clarity or lower than that, you dip down you're often going into the realm of cyanobacteria production and they're the dominant group causing the green water, which is a complete dead end for, for the, the entire system. It's not going up the food web to grow big fish, it's going down the food web. If you have less turbid water, you're going to have less of those stressors that are gonna compound. And you're gonna have more feeding time, better food source, and you'll be able to grow world-class fish. Metaflock is bringing this lake into a new steady state. I can't tell you how many times where we've been able to save a fishery from going completely belly up just by getting the material that's causing and driving the ammonia spikes out of the water. So this is changing the entire ecosystem for the better and bringing it into a much better food web dynamics for growing trophy world-class fish. I mean, I'm seeing stuff out here I haven't seen in years. So, now it won't always stay this way, but this is indicative of this treatment is taking hold and it's doing what it's supposed to do. Well, I just wanted to call and tell you, we're about to do a SECI disc reading so we can, you know, have hard and fast data on how much visibility we have. We should be, but this morning you should know we had 17 inches of visibility before Metaflop.